Chapter 27 Once night had fallen, I sent Bongo on her next mission. All you have to do is untie Samara's wish, I instructed. Oh, she said. Is that all? Bongo flew to the low branch where Samar had tied her pink dotted fabric strip. She yanked on it with her beak several times. Easier said than done, she reported. You're a crow, use a tool. Crows are well known for making and using tools. They're probably the brainiest birds around. Hmm, Bongo poked and considered. I have a paper clip in my collection. I'll give that a shot. It'll never work, Agnes predicted from her nest. I think owls are secretly a bit jealous of crows. One by one, heads poked out of my hollows, as well as the skunk den under the porch, to watch Bongo work. What's Bongo doing, Ma? asked one of the ewes. It's called tool use, said Big U. No big deal. Folks, if you can't say something helpful, I said, please don't say anything at all. Bongo returned with a piece of twisted metal. Straightened paper clip, she explained. Found it on the school playground. With great effort, she managed to slide the straight end of the paper clip into the knot. But try as she might, she couldn't pull the knot free. Almost got it, Bongo muttered between her clenched beak. Why is Bongo doing that, Harold asked Agnes. There's no explaining crows, Agnes said. Because I asked her to, I said, because it's important to me. With a frustrated groan, Bongo let the paper clip fall to the ground. It's no use, Red, she said. Maybe it's time to give up on this idea, I said with a sigh. I'm not meant to help. I'm meant to sit here, just sit. A gentle wind rippled my leaves. No one spoke. Wait just a minute, said Big U. Maybe I can lend you a paw. You're awfully heavy for that branch, Agnes pointed out. Let her try, I said. Carefully, Big U inched her way out onto the limb where Samar's wish was tied. She was indeed heavy, and my branch bowed under her weight, but I held firm. She toyed with the knot, using both front paws. Before long, she pulled the strip free. Ta-da, she cried, clutching the fabric in her right paw. Well, I did the hard part, Bongo sulked. It was a joint effort, I said. Teamwork, and much appreciated, both of you. You have the wi wish, said Agnes. Now what, Red? Now we wait until Samar comes to visit, I said, and then Bongo works her magic. Chapter 28 The moon bathed us all in cool blue light as we awaited Samar's nightly visit. She came out in her robe and slippers. Sitting on her blanket, she waited patiently as the baby scrambled over to see her. Around her neck, she was wearing the beribboned key that Bongo had given her. Where's my crow friend, she whispered as the ewes somersaulted in front of her. She looked up into my branches, and I was glad I'd instructed Bongo to hide on Stefan's roof. Right on schedule, Bongo flew into Stefan's bedroom window. She settled on the sill. Samara's fab fabric scrap dangled in her beak. Carefully, she tapped on Stefan's window. Nothing happened. I told Bongo to be as quiet as possible. We didn't want Samara to see what we were up to. Tap, tap, tap louder this time. Still nothing. Stefan apparently was quite a sound sleeper. Bongo looked at me. Her eyes said, now what? She tried again. Tap, tap, tap. Samar started. What was that? She asked. Fortunately, Harold distracted her with an attempt to fly onto her arm. It was more an awkward hop than flight, and Samar giggled. Good going, little Harold, I thought. Bongo dropped Samara's wish onto the sill. Tap, tap, tap. Nothing. She paced back and forth in front of the window. Then she froze. Her eyes glinted in the moonlight. Bongo leaned close to the glass and performed her very best fire engine. By the time Stefan's window flew open, Bongo was already back on the roof, watching her efforts pay off. Stefan peered out. He rubbed his eyes. He noticed the scrap on his sill. Frowning, he held it up, catching the moonlight in order to read the words written on the fabric. He looked down at the lawn. There was Samar, looking up at him, surrounded by an odd collection of baby animals. You rock, said Bongo. Chapter 29 When Stefan eased out the front door, he was wearing red pajamas and a gray sweatshirt. 
His light brown hair was mussed, his eyes bleary. The flashlight he was carrying sliced through the darkness. The babies turned toward him and froze. Their eyes glowed like little moons. Flash squealed in fear. Stefan clicked off his light and Flash seemed to calm a bit, although he was definitely hiccuping. Hey, Stefan whispered. Hi, Samar whispered back. Stefan sat down next to Samar. The babies watched with interest. Why do they come to you, Stefan asked. I don't know. It's like magic. No, Samar Sugar said, shook her head. I'm just quiet. They like that. Bongo flew down to Samar's shoulder. Hello, she said to Stefan, mimicking Samar's voice. Wow, he said. That's amazing. Yesterday I heard her imitate a doorbell. Stefan grinned. She gave me this key, Samar said, holding it up. I don't know what it's for, a diary or a jewelry box, maybe. Or the world's smallest door, Stefan joked. For a while, everyone fell silent. Even the baby raccoons were still. At last, Stefan held out his hand, revealing Samar's wish. I found this, he said. Even in the moonlight, Samar's blush was visible. She looked away. I'm sorry about that word, Stefan said softly. The word on the tree. We didn't. It wasn't us. Samar nodded. My parents aren't bad people. They're just afraid of things, Stefan shrugged. So were mine, said Samar. I heard my father talking about moving. If we can find a safe place to go, she gave a sad smile. If there even is such a place. I'm sorry, Stefan said again. The babies, sensing Stefan could be trusted, began to tussle and romp. Harold and the smallest, Harold and the smallest you searched for bugs. Rose Petal and her brother, Hot Buttered Popcorn, played tug of war with a long piece of grass. I'll miss them, Samar said. I hope you don't move, Stefan said. A light blinked on in Stefan's house. I should go, he said. If my parents see me, I should go. Night, Samar said in a whisper. Oh, the things I wanted to say to those two. I wanted to tell them that friendship doesn't have to be hard. That sometimes we let the world make it hard. I wanted to tell them to keep talking. I wanted to make a difference. Just a little difference before I left this lovely world. And so I did it. I broke the rule. Stay, I said. Chapter 30. The animals gaped at me in astonishment. Even the youngest babies knew the don't talk to people rule. Bongo darted to my top branch. Red, she cried in a stra strangled whisper. You can't. Oh, but I can, I said. What have I got to lose? But as I was saying, I returned my attention to Stefan and Samar. They were staring at me, jaws dropped, eyes wide, as frozen as Flash had been not long ago. We're dreaming, Stefan murmured. Right? At the same time, Samar asked? Is that possible? Pinch me, Stefan said. Samar complied. Definitely felt that, Stefan reported. Maybe it was a dream pinch, Samar suggested. Excuse me, I interrupted. I have 216 rings worth of wisdom to convey, and not much time. Stefan reached for Samar's hand. If it's a dream, he said, at least it's a cool one. And so I began. Chapter 31. I haven't always been a wish tree. It happened in 1848, long before I was surrounded by concrete and cars, and when I was just a few decades old, still a youngster by Red Oak standards. No longer a lanky sapling, I was solid and strong, but not anchored to the earth the way I am now. This was a time, like many other times, when hungry, desperate people sailed on crowded boats to settle here. Many of them ended up, as they always seemed to, in my neighborhood. The blue and green houses were brown then, and filled to overflowing with new arrivals. Sometimes the newcomers were welcomed, sometimes they were not. But still they came, hoping and wishing, as people always do. One of our new residents was a young Irish girl named Maeve. She'd voyaged across the Atlantic with her 19-year-old brother, who died of dysentery during the trip. Their mother had passed away shortly after Maeve was born, their father when the children were 9 and 12. Maeve was solid and plain, but when she smiled, it was like sunshine peeking through the clouds. She had a deep laugh, and her hair was as brilliantly red as my finest autumn attire. 
16 alone and penniless, Maeve shared a tiny room with five other immigrants. She worked night and day cleaning and cooking and doing whatever she could to stay alive. Maeve soon discovered she was gifted at caring for the sick. She had no special knowledge, no secret remedies, but she was kind and patient, and she knew how to soothe a fevered brow with a cool cloth as well as anyone. What she didn't know, she was willing to learn. As time passed, word grew of Maeve's abilities. People brought her their sick piglets and their lame horses, their coughing children and fretful babies. Always, she explained, that she wasn't sure she could help. But since people in the neighborhood were too poor to go to a doctor, they turned to Maeve. And since people believed she could help them get better, Maeve tried to live up to their hopes. When she succeeded, and even when she didn't, patients and their families would leave small tokens for her. A whittled figurine of a bird, a hairpin, half a loaf of bread. Once someone even left her a leather-covered journal with a tiny silver key that opened its lock. When Maeve was out tending to someone who was sick, people took to leaving their thank yous in my lowest hollow. It was still a fresh wound, just a couple of seasons mended. But because it faced the house where Maeve roomed and not the street, it was a safe place to leave a token of gratitude. That's when I realized that hollows can be a good thing for people, not just birds and animals. Little did I know just how good.